Picture this, there are thousands of people living in close proximity to one another. They all have various jobs and responsibilities. Some start their day at sunrise while others work the graveyard shift. Many of them are close friends and companions. There's a library, there's a movie theatre, places to shop, a laundromat, and a hospital. No, this isn't the average small town that you can find in all corners of the globe. In fact, this place doesn't even have a permanent location. This is life on the average modern day aircraft carrier, a floating city. These massive vessels fly under the flags of the United States, the UK, China, Japan, and France, amongst others, representing the strength and brawn of their navies. Today, they're almost synonymous with the very thought of what a warship is. They've been featured in some of the most popular movies of all time, and they're the backbone of some of the world's most powerful navies. But it wasn't always that way. The fact is that the journey the aircraft carrier took from being a mere thought experiment to a bona fide capital ship took decades to become a reality. Along the way, they went through complex design evolutions, and by the time they resembled the ships of today, they'd completely changed war forever. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs, and this is the story of how the aircraft carrier became the world's most powerful warship. We've always been fascinated by the skies as a species, and centuries ago, inventors were experimenting with putting things up there from ships. The earliest recorded instance of using a ship for airborne operations occurred at the dawn of the 19th century. In 1806, Lord Cochrane of the Royal Navy launched kites from his ship, the frigate HMS Pallas. Attached to the kites were brochures speaking out against Napoleon Bonaparte. The kite strings were set on fire, and when they burnt through, the leaflets descended down from the sky and landed on French soil. Four decades later, in 1849, the Austrian Navy warship SMS Volcano was being used for launching balloons. Now this was a lot more insidious. The intent was to launch hot air balloons equipped with a 24 to 30 pound, 13 kilogram bomb with a timed fuse and then have them drop down on the city of Venice. At least one bomb did actually drop over its intended target, but thanks to the changing winds after launch, most balloons missed and some actually even drifted back over the Austrian border. The American Civil War had its fair share of ship-based aerial operations too. Here, gas-filled balloons launched by Union ships were used to perform reconnaissance on Confederate positions. The Union actually maintained a balloon corps and was launching balloons from land, but once the fighting turned to inland Virginia, the forestry grew too thick for the balloons to reach their intended destinations. Instead, the Union retrofitted a coal barge to carry gas generators and balloon apparatuses, and from the ship balloons were able to be launched to fly over the Potomac River. This was claimed to be a successful mission, and the idea caught on. Even as recently as the Second World War, various navies were still launching balloons from ships to serve as aerial observation posts. In the early 1900s, the technological landscape was changed forever by the development of one of mankind's greatest inventions, the flying machine. Now, obviously, it would only be natural that launches from ships would follow suit, but it wouldn't be a quick and easy process. Way back in 1910, the French vessel Foudre was the first seaplane carrier. Now, a seaplane carrier doesn't perform the same functions as an aircraft carrier, but it's easy to see their shared lineage. Seaplane carriers instead stored seaplanes under hangars on the main deck, from which they could be lowered into the sea with a crane. Seaplane carriers also allowed for the planes to be stored, transported, and have maintenance performed on the move at sea. In the early 20th century, the development of aircraft encouraged the world's navies to begin taking interest in their potential for use as scouts for their big gun warships. See, for centuries, the massive battleship had dominated the waves as the main, powerful naval asset. At first, there'd been big wooden warships, culminating in the monstrous three deck ships of the line like HMS Victory in the 1800s. But by the time the airplane had become popularised, they were now enormous steel dreadnoughts. Now, their might and firepower was impressive, but even then, for the time, some visionaries had some incredible foresight. In 1909, French inventor and engineer Clément Adair said, An airplane carrying vessel is indispensable. These vessels will be constructed on a plan very different from what is currently used. First of all, the deck will be cleared of all obstacles. It will be flat, as wide as possible without jeopardising the nautical lines of the hull, and it will look like a landing field. 
Monsieur Aday could not have been more in tune with what the future of naval warfare would look like, and in just 20 years, he'd be proven strikingly correct. To launch airplanes from their ships, designers started to attach structures to pre-existing vessels where planes could take off from, and then even land on in some early experiments. Now, of course, the First World War proved to be a fundamental proving ground for naval aviation on all sides. In particular, both British and American shore-based seaplane units were tasked with flying anti-submarine patrols. The US Navy also experimented with launching wheeled aircraft off of wooden platforms attached to battleships. In 1915, the USS North Carolina fielded the first at-sea aircraft catapult. It was clear, though, that these ideas were only in their infancy. Yes, planes were launching from ships, but they had no way of returning. Upon completion of a mission, pilots would attempt to land ashore, or if they weren't able to, they ditched their plane in the sea and just hoped to be fished out of the water. Although the concept was still being perfected, naval aviation was beginning to prove its worth. One notable example of the signs of the times was the HMS Furious. She'd been designed as a conventional, heavily armed, courageous class warship, but was then converted mid-construction instead into a kind of hybrid aircraft carrying battle cruiser. In July of 1918, seven Sopwith Camels launched from Furious and destroyed two Zeppelins at the Tondern airship base in Denmark. Now, the Germans had been using this base to conduct nighttime bombing raids over Britain, but the bombing of Tondern caught the Germans completely by surprise because they thought the base was way too far out of reach of British aircraft. But despite the success of the raid, the shortcomings of early aircraft carrying ships were proven by the fact that not one of the seven Camels made it back to Furious. World War I had convinced Navy officials that airplanes were, obviously, essential on the modern battlefield. But very few believed they served much more purpose beyond just observing the fall of shot for their big battleships. But tests conducted in the 1920s by visionaries like Brigadier General Billy Mitchell hinted that the era of the aircraft carrier was clearly on the horizon. Officially, the first aircraft carrier ever was the British HMS Argus of 1918. The British government had purchased the not yet completed Italian ocean liner Conte Rosso, whose construction had been halted thanks to the outbreak of the war. The vessel was converted to be the first true aircraft carrier with an unobstructed flight deck just as Clement Adair had predicted way back in 1909. Finally, aircraft could take off and land from the same ship. Argus was like a floating airfield in the middle of the ocean, and war would never be the same again. The First World War had ended before the Argus could ever be put into action, but her design had inspired the United States and Japanese navies to quickly follow suit with carriers of their own. While the Argus is the ship credited as the first aircraft carrier, Japan's Hosho was the first carrier designed as such from the keel up when she entered service in December 1922. The United States wasn't far behind with the commission of USS Langley the same year, it was essentially an experiment to see if aircraft could operate effectively off of ships, and Langley showed it was indeed possible. She served as a training ship for the US Navy's first generation of daring carrier aviators. The progression towards the world's most powerful flat-top warships was well underway, but even then, very, very few understood the true power and potential of these warships because they'd never been tested in combat, but that was going to change very, very soon. Proponents of the aircraft carry managed to push against internal resistance to have examples built all over the world in the 1920s. The world saw the debut of the HMS Hermes from the UK, the Bayonne from France, and the Lexington-class aircraft carriers from the United States in 1927. Originally, most of this early generation of aircraft carriers were actually conversions of ships that had been laid down instead as cargo ships, cruisers, battle cruisers, or even battleships. This allowed for navies to incorporate carriers into their fleets quicker, but it also shows just how little real thought was being given to the aircraft carrier as a weapon. As the 1920s wore on, this slowly began to change. While converting ships was relatively quick and easy, ordering carriers purpose-built allowed the design to be specialised for their future role and resulted in far superior ships. Finally, in 1939, the true dawn of the aircraft carrier began. It was during World War II that aircraft carriers were used on a large scale for the first time and proved themselves not just as a novelty, but as the absolute backbone of the modern navy. They had just missed serving their purpose for World War I, but now they were ready. In a shocking twist, the world's most powerful battleships began to be hunted down and sunk by swarms of aircraft launched from carriers. 
The intense demand for carrier fleets led to further improvements in their design and the recovery process for their aircraft. In the end, thanks to the rapid progress of war, several itineraries of carriers were designed and put into service. The US constructed small, slow escort carriers to provide air support for convoys and amphibious invasions. Later, they developed light aircraft carriers like the USS Independence, which were faster than the escort concept, and intended to keep up to speed with the fleet. Many of these ships were fast because they were originally converted from cruisers that were actually already under construction. In fact, before war had broken out, US President Franklin Delano Roosevelt had observed a lack of new aircraft carriers scheduled to join the fleet before 1944. He was the one who'd suggested converting the existing Cleveland-class cruisers' hulls. This bit of foresight helped swing the war in the Pacific in the US's favour because they could quickly get carriers out into action at a rate significantly faster than their Japanese adversaries could. Away from the Pacific, carriers saw heavy action too in the Atlantic, where the Atlantic convoys needed protection from German submarines. The British developed what they called the Merchant Carrier. These were merchant ships equipped with a flat deck for up to six aircraft. They served as a stopgap until dedicated carriers could be constructed on a wider basis. These typically carried around 20 to 30 aircraft total, and were used primarily for anti-submarine operations. Given the ferocity of U-boat attacks from the Germans at the time, this was a critical assignment. Any tool to win the war at the Atlantic was welcome indeed. Of course, the UK used escort carriers as well. They were built on commercial freighter hulls, which made their construction quicker and cheaper. They were slow to keep up with the main forces of fleet carriers, battleships and cruisers, but they did a good job escorting sluggish merchant convoys, defending them from enemy submarines and aircraft. On the downside though, these ships were only lightly protected, and several were sunk with a great loss of life. It became obvious during the Second World War that aircraft carriers were playing a crucial role. At one point, the Royal Navy had several aircraft carriers in their fleet, while the Germans and the Italians had none. The capabilities of aircraft carriers could not have been more adequately demonstrated. In 1940, the ancient-looking fairy swordfish torpedo bombers attacked and damaged the Italian fleet at Taranto for only two losses. Well, the next year, they badly damaged the German battleship Bismarck so she could be hunted down and destroyed. Both raids had been launched by British carriers. In December the same year, the US Navy base at Pearl Harbor was decimated by a carrier-based Japanese attack. The advantages to using carriers were clear. To Navy planners' shock, they were making the world's most powerful battleships completely obsolete. Few would argue over the power of the image of the battleship. They served as a floating platform and advertising billboard for the strength of their home nation. Their time as the premier member of the fleet, though, was not long to be had. The tremendous battleship losses during the war changed the way navies even thought about their fleet's compositions. Here's an example. There's no argument that during the Second World War, the United States possessed some of the world's most powerful and sophisticated battleships. These culminated in the Iowa class. They served their countries on and off from the 1940s all the way up until the early 1990s when the last battleship was finally decommissioned. But at one point, the US Navy was designing an even larger, more powerful and more sophisticated battleship to replace the Iowas, and these would have been called the Montana class. They would have featured massive 16-inch guns and enhanced protection designed to go up against Japan's Yamato-class super battleships, the largest ever built. In July of 1940, five ships in the Montana class were approved for construction with work to begin later that year. Ultimately, the writing was on the wall for the Montana class because by 1943 it was clear to everyone that the aircraft carrier had supplanted the battleship as the premier weapon in the Navy's arsenal. The concept was cancelled. And in a bit of tragic irony, the arrangement of the propulsion system found in the Montana class was modified instead to be used in the Midway class aircraft carriers instead. The lesson was learnt time and time again at sea in momentous battles like Midway, Philippine Sea and the Leyte Gulf, where instead of Japan and America's battleships slogging it out like prize fighters, it was just the aircraft carriers and their squadrons going toe to toe. A squadron of dive bombers could menace big ships and destroy them with relative ease. On top of that, battleships were big and heavy. They required a significant amount of fuel and maintenance, which made them particularly costly. It's not as if battleships no longer served a purpose. They could still bombard shores to prep the battlefield for amphibious landings. They did this job very well at D-Day, Okinawa, Iwo Jima, and more. This was an important role, but ultimately wasn't enough reason to justify keeping them. The ever-decreasing role of the battleship was not just unique to the United States Navy by the end of World War II. 
perhaps nothing demonstrated this better than when aircraft launched from US carriers sank the largest battleships ever built, the Japanese warships Musashi in 1944 and Yamato in 1945. Yamato had had her anti-air defense strengthened enormously in the war. She'd started out with just 24 anti-aircraft guns and ended with 150, but in the end, it was all for naught. She was completely wrecked from above in just two hours. The era of the battleship was over. And even then, the aircraft carrier went from strength to strength. After the war, the jet age allowed smaller and less expensive ships to provide maximum firepower and destructive capability. Then the development of guided bombs made it even easier for aircraft to sink warships. Planes launched from carriers could even bombard shore establishments more effectively than big battleships ever could. But crucially, this isn't just a story of successful ship design, because as the aircraft carrier developed, so too did the aircraft actually deployed on them. Now, if not for this, and the more powerful aircraft through history, then the aircraft carrier would have remained little more than a novelty. One massive advantage was the range. With the development of external fuel storage like drop tanks, aircraft could deliver an attack from 200 miles, 320 kilometers away, or more. Meanwhile, once upon a time, a battleship would need to get within just 20 miles or less to carry out the very same attack. Originally, the biggest reason people were skeptical of airborne attacks was the uncertainty that aircraft could lift enough destructive weapons to supersede the battleship. Originally in the 1930s, this was a pretty valid concern. By the end of the decade, though, it was no longer the case. In 1918, the Tondern Raid Force had flown SOP with camels capable of carrying just two 50-pound, 22-kilogram bombs. By the end of World War II, though, British carrier bombers like the Fairy Firefly could mount twin 1,000-pound, 450 kilogram bombs or eight rockets. Aircraft were carrying adequate payloads, dive bomber and torpedo plane designs had matured, and carrier arrestor gear and flight deck handling facilities were more than up to the task. Aircraft carriers had proved themselves as one of the most effective weapons against the ever threatening German U boats. They could launch airplanes to find and sink Kriegsmarine submarines and became the scourge of the German Navy. The carrier centric fleet was most famously proven in the Pacific but it was also crucial in turning the tide in the Battle of the Atlantic and the ultimate Allied victory in World War II. The evolution of technology is a natural and inevitable force. All things will eventually be replaced by something more powerful, more efficient, and stronger than the thing that had come before it. From their humble beginnings as novelties to becoming the flagship of world navies, aircraft carriers have truly encapsulated this idea. So revolutionary were they, in fact, that today carriers still patrol the world's oceans like knights in a game of political chess. Massive steel sentinels on the sea ready to enforce their home nation's will. There's little more intimidating than a modern day aircraft carrier and the destruction they can bring. We can only hope we won't really be needing it anytime soon. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Oceanliner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel because we get new videos out weekly. If you want to support my work and get really cool perks like behind the scenes and early access, please visit my Patreon in the link in the description below or sign up as a YouTube member. Come and join the crew. And as always, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.